Well, good morning. Come on up, Jim. Good morning and welcome to Hope Presbyterian Church and especially Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers. And uh, we are glad that you're here with us as we worship for, as you just sang. I know those words are odd because you're used to hearing them. That tune is come now found. But um, we are being called by our loving Savior to gather as a community, but to gather into the stream of what he has been doing for millennia at making the world a right and just and loving place. And so it is in that stream that we worship. Let's prepare with just a moment of silence and then Jim will lead us. Amen. Let us rise for our call to worship. Rejoice, heavenly powers. Sing, choirs of angels. Exult, God's throne. Jesus Christ, our King, is risen. Sound the trumpet of salvation. Rejoice, heavenly powers and angels. Jesus Christ, our King, is risen. To the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. Let us pray. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. We openly proclaim that you are our great hope. We wait for you, Father God, like watchmen wait for the morning. Like watchmen wait for the morning. We put all our hope in you, Lord Christ, you who are full of unfailing love. You are the one who redeems us from all of our sins. Holy Spirit, make us new this morning and flood our hearts with your presence. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. amen. forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the sun, I'm sorry, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, I do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As it is our usual practice, we come now to a time of confessing our sins before the Lord, which is uh, needful. Um, so follow along, join with me. Loving God, we confess our sins. At times we do not share in the joy of the resurrection, but are caught in the worries of the world. We do not always live in the spirit of new life, but remain discontent, grumbling, and anxious. We find it more comfortable to worry and complain than to risk the joy and encouragement of new life in Christ. and assurance of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We are brothers and sisters through his blood. We have died together. We will, we will rise together. We will live together. Now let us rise in body or in spirit. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. All are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Thanks be to God. The peace of the Lord be with you. Also with you. Let's greet one another in that peace. This is the Lord be with you. Peace be with you online. Peace be with you online. Peace be with you online.
seated. We continue to worship with the giving of God's tithes and our offerings, either online or in the bin back there, as is our drill. But, um, of course, especially after, I, as many of you know, that's one of my favorite songs we just sang. I have inflicted it on you regularly in light of the free offer of the gospel, the beauty of what we just sang about. We want to be generous people, and so we do. We offer our whole selves in prayer. So join us uh, in this prayer offering. to prayer, I want to just, I'm going to move to the microphone. I want to uh, remind you of some things going on in the life of our church, and that is SNF is happening tonight, I guess. I thought with Mother's Day they might cancel it, but uh, students, you can go to that. As well, on the back of your worship guide, In the Life of Hope, I remind you that we still have three slots, actually, two days, but three slots for serving at uh, English Meadows. So uh, I believe they are May 14th, sa next Saturday, we need one more. And then the Tuesday after that, we have one Tuesday in this cycle that we're doing, uh, and there are two slots available there. So please, if you're able, would love to have you um, help serve them with bingo, those in our community. Um, then also, we've announced last week and sent out some emails about Eagle Run. We have signed us, tried to keep us as a group. They may disperse us to where we're needed, but if you still, next Friday night, Crozet Elementary School still needs some help, right, Mary? few more I looked this morning there's still a few more slots um, so if you are able to serve the school so that parents can be with their kids and we can take care of some of the details of that event for them um, then let the office know and they'll sign you up on the doodle poll sheet that uh, the PTO has put up okay so I think uh, those are all of our items um, let's move to prayer yeah Oh, I absolutely forgot. Judy has an announcement. This is not something, you should this is not something to forget <laughs> at all. I just pushed the pastor aside. You saw that. That's right. That's fine. <laughs> so we were, the pastor started out our morning wishing us all a happy Mother's Day, which is a big day to celebrate. We have another day to celebrate, Hope Family Day on June 5th. And, you know, we have a lot to celebrate. God has given us a lot in this church family. And there's so much more, I think, that, there, that we have to offer one another, to gather from one another, both in, in growth, encouragement, and blessings. So June 5th, I hope you all will put it on your calendars and plan to be there. Uh, bring games, because we're going to we'll worship together in this beautiful park. Uh, I think it's... Grand Caverns Regional Park over in Grottos, and it's really not a far drive. It's a beautiful drive, and it's a beautiful park. Worship, then we'll eat together, then we'll play together. And if it's anything like last year, we got really silly. It was totally fun. So um, I hope that happens again this year. So, um, yeah. And somebody should challenge me to this. Oh yeah, so uh, I'm gonna get. I was actually gonna get to that, Louie. Um, so, so for food, uh, you really just need to bring a sandwich or whatever. The church is gonna have drinks. They're gonna have watermelon uh, with seeds, so we can have a seed spinning contest. I think Lou wants you all to know that he won it last year <laughs> with some ridiculous amount, like 28 feet. Wow. That's a lot, a lot to beat, but uh, I think it shows who has hot air, whatever. <laughs> um, so anyhow, that, so, and there'll be uh, chips, um, hummus, carrots, dessert, and the not unimportant paper products. So uh, you don't need to bring any of that stuff either. You might want to bring a chair for worship time, but there are uh, picnic tables there, and we'll certainly use those for lunch. Bring games. Uh, bring board games outdoor games we had some board games last year that were so fun to play 
Um, and then people played volleyball, there's all croquet. I mean, if you have those things, bring them, because uh, there's something for everybody. From the young to the old, I think everyone had a grand time. So, June 5th. Thank you. And I'm sorry I forgot. And did you catch that at the end? Everyone had a grand time? Because oh. <laughs> we're going to grand caverns. Yeah. I, I remind you again, our desire, this started four or five years ago because the leadership team at the time was like, we need to have a retreat together and just not being able to find a weekend. We said, we're going to do a one day thing. So please come for as much of that as you can or as little of that as you can. All right. Now we will turn to prayer. Um, I, uh, I would ask, we, um, we have some of our same issues. Folks at home with COVID, we continue to languish under COVID. Ukraine and Russia is still an issue. But then in light of uh, this week's headlines, and in light of the, the leak out of the Supreme Court, I'm going to pray about um, our country. I just, disclaimer right now, it's, it's a, a difficult thing to pray about, right? And there's partisan sides on each of these. Um, and uh, I will not pray a perfect prayer, but we want to lean in and pray for our country. And um, we want to care for those who are unborn as well as mothers. Anyway, let's, let's pray. I'll just do a pastoral prayer. How about that? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you as your people. We come to, your, to you as your people in a, in a broken, complex world. Even as we think of our own hearts and our own lives, how desperately we need your grace and mercy to work in us, to make us loving, to make us um, non-selfish, to encourage us to look outside of ourselves. So Lord, would you increase our love and favor and uh, enthrallment with you that we would be different people in our age? But Lord, in light of this leak this week, we, um, we do want to pray for our nation. This is a complex issue, Lord. And we, of course, do not want to see any more unborn children aborted and discarded. We pray, Lord, against this happening. And yet at the same time, we do not want to see mothers and fathers in difficult surprise situations uncared for and scared and panicky and unloved and unnurtured. So Lord, help in that manner as well, please. We are praying here, Lord, for our country, that you would work in hearts and guide our country to a deeper appreciation of the preciousness of life, that many more people would celebrate and value life especially in the womb and toward the tomb and in between. Lord, this is a prayer that we can't change consciences. We can't change hearts. And so that's why we're praying because we are saying help. In many ways, this is revival we're asking for. In many ways, this is asking you to change hearts in lives. Could there even be a day where your sex ethic is, is celebrated as the most healthy, best option? Lord, even working in our culture that we would value suffering in a way that we don't. Father, so many things have to happen around this issue. And so help to revive and work in our nation. We do, of course, pray that you would give wisdom to legislators, to lobbyists, to courtrooms, that they would protect the innocent and the vulnerable. We do pray also that they would set up structures to increase funding for adoption and childcare. And Lord, we pray too for those who right now are providing abortions and ask that you would please soften their hearts, work in their hearts. Again, Father, we just lay them before you. They are made in your image and we love them. They are not our enemies. So we pray for them, that you would draw them to yourself. And Lord, we especially pray for the church, <laughs> us. Um, for any changes in this issue to come, we have to change as well. And Lord, I admit I'm not ready for a lot of that. We, we wanna see 
abortions fewer or maybe even not legal. And so we ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our homes to adoption, that you would open our hearts to the millions of children that will be needed, that you would give wisdom and creativity to us and to organizations to care for mothers and fathers in need. Father, help. And Lord, as we come from this issue to some of these other chronic issues, we're in the same way we're valuing life and health. We pray, Lord, for those in our congregation still quarantined from COVID, it's no fun. We pray that you would continue the process of giving wisdom and insight to heal, to, to give us clear ways forward, to get this, it will always be with us, Lord, but to get the monkey of this COVID thing off our back, we pray. And we ask to, Lord, um, for the war in the Ukraine, that you would bring peace, that you would bring um, clear-headedness on each side, that bombs would cease, that death would cease, that you would please help the nations to do good and not harm to one another. Father, again, these, this life is difficult and these issues are complex. And so we cry out, you see clearly, and we ask that you would work clearly in places. All your people are looking to your hand, for you are the good shepherd. In your name we pray these things. Amen. We now give our attention to the New Testament lesson. New Testament reading is from 1 Peter 1, 8 through 12. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's sing our prayer of illumination. Whoops, it would be helpful if I didn't sing bless this offering. <laughs> Set up here. Any children going with Emma can head to the back. So these things here. Oh, and of course, my recorder and timer. <clears throat> Sorry, I get thrown off when doing guitar. So, uh, some of you have heard this story, but about eight or nine years ago, I was uh, putting an antenna. Wait, here we go. I was putting a TV antenna up in our attic so that we, the bunny ears basically, right? We didn't, don't have cable. And I'm up in the attic working, and you know, it's that precarious, you're walking on the rafters, and I've got the little triangles coming down, and they're helping, and, and I got it positioned, but you know, I'm trying to figure out, I would climb down the ladder and then come back up to get the best angle. If you've done this, you have to figure out where Charlottesville is and try and angle it toward it. I had my compass out, and I'm doing all of that, and, and finally it was set, and it was time to ratchet everything down, and so I'm ratcheting and ratcheting and tightening and getting it set, and then I stepped incorrectly. And soon I was hanging from the rafters right here. They caught me. And 
it was over our stairwell, so I would have fallen about 12 to 15 feet. It was really dangerous, and Laura's down there, and I'm like, help, but I am hanging from the rafters, and all our insulation is all over the stairs. It was horrible. I'm one of those funniest home videos. But it, it is an example of how, you, an obvious example, of you need a good base, don't you? A good foundation. And drywall tapped into your rafters does not work well. And, and this is true of so many things. I mean, just examples that popped into my mind is where we think um, quarterback, right? They talk about their footing and having a good plant on, on throwing the ball, or else they're going to throw an interception. Right? Or, or we even talk about it metaphorically in terms of like your, your, your new job, how's it going? I don't know. We'll say, well, that makes sense. You, you need to find your footing. Right? That we know a good base, a good foundation is necessary for good things to happen. Peter knows that too. And so in this section that we're looking at today, he knows that for you to be a healthy human, you need a good base. Because things spring from that. It gives you a foundation for life to be, it's Jesus said, right? A rock versus a sand, pick the rock. And so Peter comes along and talks to his exiles and says to us as human beings, there is a base for us to build life on. And that's what we're here to talk about. We started First Peter last week with this grand vision of the living hope that God has called these people to, but he's writing exiles People who have been either thrown out of Rome or just metaphorically are not in line with their culture and feel homeless. We talked about how we feel that. And so he continues talking to them now about some of the security. Think about how insecure it feels to be an exile, to have no land, to have no inheritance. We talked about. Now, again, he continues to build a sure foundation. So here's what I'd like us to do. Three thoughts for, the, for today. And... Forgive the corny, they worked. I woke up with them and they were in my head this morning as I labored over what to do. A base, a race, and a place is what we want to get from this. A base, a race, and a place, okay? A base. Dan Doriani, professor at our um, denominational se seminary, Dr. Doriani, in his commentary on this, points out wisely, and I hadn't caught it. It's one of the reasons why we're doing this sermon. Is he, he points out that Peter is an apostle, right? He has walked with Jesus. Jesus gave him the authority to declare this gospel. Peter even kind of says that in verse 12, right? And those to you, uh, this good news that's been preached to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Jesus said he would give his apostles the Holy Spirit to establish the church. So Peter has just talked about the hope and the life and the, the salvation that has come. In verse 9, he can literally go straight into the next section, which in verse 13, we don't have it printed here, but if you have a Bible, it goes like this. Therefore, prepare your minds for action and be sober-minded. This is, this, is um, this is called the holy conduct section of Peter. He could have transitioned right into that, but he didn't. If you read verse 9 and then get your Bible out later, it could go straight into verse 13. Why then does he give us this paragraph? Why does he give us this paragraph? And that's where Doriani writes this. Peter pauses to explain the role of scripture in there, that is his reader's salvation. Peter wanted to prepare his readers to grow through scripture, both from the Old Testament and from the New Testament accounts of the suffering and glory of Christ. Peter wants to root them in scripture. Why? Well, first, it's interesting to think about his experience. You already know this. He walked with Jesus, right? He saw Jesus. He talked to Jesus. He saw Jesus resurrected. But he also was the one that when Jesus said, I must go to Jerusalem for the Son of Man will be betrayed and suffer and die. What did Peter say in Mark 8? No way, Lord. He was about to rebuke Jesus and Jesus had to rebuke Peter, right? Right? And say, get thee behind me, Satan. Because Peter didn't understand. What brought Peter to understanding? Scripture is part of that. Obviously, Jesus taught him. But what did the road to Emmaus, Peter wasn't one of them. But in his resurrection life with the apostles, we see in Luke that Jesus said, beginning with the prophets, with the law and the prophets, he explained what must happen about the Messiah. Peter knew that you, you need this Biblical word, this story of Old Testament, New Testament, informing your life to help make sense of it and what's going on. 
That was his experience. And so in this, he gives, as Doriani says, he wants them to grow and move on. And he says the foundation, the base for that is scripture. And so he gives us a high view of scripture, a very high view of scripture in this. I'm going to kind of pull together some other things he said, but even just looking at your passage, right? Verse 10, the prophets who prophesied about grace, they searched and inquired carefully. So they were very invested in what they were writing, as he's saying. But it was the spirit of Christ in them revealing. And so this is not the most clear place of our biblical idea of inspiration, but it is hinting at it, right? This idea that God has inspired men in such a way so that the word of God is the very word of God and the very word of these men. There are different views. This is kind of a quick teaching excursus of what, of what in, inspiration could mean. Some would say it's kind of dictation and they didn't know and God just said it. And there are times where God says, thus saith the Lord, write this down. But that's not what we believe happened. This high view of scripture is not either. Another one is this view of accommodation that God, God, um, I want to get this one right because it's not a view you hear very much, but the, the message has in it these minor details that are reflecting the culture of the age, but really God just was kind of using the big idea behind them. That's not the view of scripture either. The view of scripture is that what does Jesus say? Every jot and tittle is God's word, inspired to come. It's, it's why I said I would use these other verses. One of the classic ones is in his next book. Peter would write that no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That God's word would come. And then even in that second, in chapter three of second Peter, what does he call Paul's writings? Scripture. He says, like the other scriptures. So he's saying not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament are to be this foundation as he's writing these Christians from Rome, this place to give us a sure base on which to live. And so we believe in what's called verbal plenary inspiration. It's basically that God supervised everything so that every verbally, that every idea, it's not just ideas, it's every word. And then it's plenary, like when you have a plenary sec section on a conference that everybody comes to. It's everything. All of it is inspired by God. And it gives us the base on which to stand. It's why our confession of faith, the Westminster Confession, says in chapter, well, guess what chapter scripture is in this? When they wanted to lay out what a summary of what the Bible is teaching, they started not with God. Not with Jesus, not with knowledge even. They started with scripture. Because God revealing himself, a doctrine of scripture is where they said to, to write our future of what God, of what we see God teaching, the base, the starting point has to be scripture. And so it writes, the last part of chapter one is the supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined and all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men and private spirits are to be examined, and in whose sentence we are to rest can be none other but the Holy Spirit speaking in the scriptures. What's my point? My, my point quickly to end this, this base one is we need this word, this reminder from Peter because of the age in which we live. We live in an age of relativism, uh, relativism of whatever, <laughs> of whatever's true for you, whatever, whatever goes. This gives us a base. This gives us a word on which to stand and point to. It's, it's the classic illustration of Francis Schaeffer saying that in our age, people have both feet planted firmly in midair because they have no base. Or to use another example, Cornelius Van Til used this one. He said, imagine that mankind as a being is made out of water and they live in an infinitely extended bottomless ocean of water and desiring to get out of that water he makes a ladder out of water. <laughs> and yet his ladder is set upon water and against water, and then he attempts to climb out of the water. So he concludes, so hopeless and senseless a picture must be drawn of the natural man's methodology based as it is upon the assumption that time or chance is ultimate. On his assumption, his own rationality is a product of chance. On his assumption, even the laws of logic which he employs are products of chance. The rationality and purpose that he may be searching for are still bound up to be products of chance. 
We have a living hope, not chance. And Peter points us to this base. So one question I asked here of myself was, do I really hunger for this? Do I really see this need to be in Scripture to have this base? So the base. The race. The race. Um, Peter writes in 1.1, we already alluded to that. He says, uh, to the exiles in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These were maybe Jews, maybe Gentiles, but they're in modern-day Turkey. Okay? Many of them are probably different cultures. That's enough spread out. They're different languages, different ethnicities, even. And as, as in this transient time of people traveling the trade routes there, you're going to have people from way different nations going on. And, and these different languages, different customs, different histories. Peter speaks into that and says, what does he do? He says... Concerning this salvation that you now, church, have found, the prophets who prophesied about grace searched and inquired, but they were serving you, that you have now come to love Jesus, as he says. Here, here's my point. These people are no longer, the church is no longer to be defined by their culture, by their place. Well, I'm a Cappadocian. Well, I'm from Bithynia. No longer to be defined by language or custom. No longer to be defined by their culture or costumes. They are to be defined by the fact that they are God's children. They are united to Christ. That they have a love for Christ and have discovered by grace his gospel. It gives them a new humanity. That's where I chose race didn't really fit, right? But you get what my point is? It's a new humanity that they're engaging. As one commentator put it this way, by establishing the relevance of the Old Testament to his readers, Peter is pointing out that they are no longer citizens of diverse nations, but have joined to the one people of God. Their self-understanding must be shaped by this new reality. This self-understanding must be shaped by this new reality. And ours must be too. That the truest thing about us, if you have embraced Jesus, and again, I know that we are so glad that people are here that haven't and are considering this, but if you have, that is your truest, deepest self-understanding identity. That's important in our age. In all our talk of identity formation, in all our talk of how identity happens, because remember, I, I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. And I'll send out a video link of a great thing that Tim Keller did on how this relates to issues of of gender and sexuality, but that we live in a culture of expressive individualism. The self is at the center of our universe right now. Expressive individualism. Just listen to these two songs from Disney, or, or well, the first two songs from movies. The Greatest Showman. I don't know if you like The Greatest Showman or care for The Greatest Showman, but in the song, This Is Me, I am who I'm meant to be. This is me. Look out, because here I come, and I'm marching on to the beat. I, I want to sing it. I, the beat I drum. I'm not scared to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me. It's a great thing that Christians should celebrate in the dignity of being in the image of God. But the point of this movie is that I know who I am inside, and I express that out. And you need to relate to me that way, right? That is, that is who I am. It's identity formation from the inside out. And that's a new thing in a culture that has not been around for long. Another example is uh, Frozen, right? When the ice queen sings, let it go, let it go. I can't hold it back anymore. Let it go, turn away, slow, slam the door. I don't care what they're going to say. She's saying, this is me. I've got to go become my true self out here and let the ice flow. It's expressive. It comes out from above. What is Peter's point here? That identity formation in the Bible is external. It's a relational identity. It's the fact that I'm in relation to a God, to myself, to others, and to his world. And to the story of what he has been doing. That it comes from external means. And our culture doesn't like that idea. But scripture is an external word. That's why Peter is rooting them here. Because he wants to say, it is truer of you. Is that a word, truer? Anyway, more true of you. That you are God's. That you are part of this new humanity. This long stream of what he's been doing with the prophets. You are, that is more true of you than what you feel. 
than what you find inside of you because they were exiles. They were struggling, remember? They're suffering and we're gonna see that more. And he's saying it is more true that you are gods and it is important. Dick Kyes, in his book of, called Beyond Identity, writes this about our culture. A table, this is a longer quote, but I think it'll make sense. A table or a chair just is. But a human being needs to feel that he or she exists in terms of something, some standard or point of integration. You see, a woman could be single, often depressed, could earn an average income, be resentful of her father, and have an optimistic view of her country's future. However, these are temporary features of her life. Any one of them can change, and none of them is large enough or solid enough to be the core of her identity. Do you hear that solid in light of a base? The, the solid enough to be the core of her identity. But the question remains, to what does she relate? How does she come to grips with the reality which is hers? To adequately deal with these questions, she needs to know what kind of world she is living in and what her place in it is. She needs to know what she values, whether she has any conscious control over her life, and if there is any self-worth that is worth searching for. So he then concludes, one writer speaks of each of us having a master story, some kind of picture of what the world is like and how it works. In light of this story, we interpret the meaning of our lives. Do you see Peter rooting them in the story to have an identity? It's interesting. He then quotes in this book, Eric uh, Erickson, who was a psychologist, as many of you know, Danish, I think Danish, um, and not a believer in Jesus, but he wrote this when talking about identity. How did man get his desire for identity? How did man need for identity? How did man's, Erickson writes this, how did man's need for identity evolve? Before Darwin, the answer was clear because God created Adam in his image, a counterplayer of his identity. I admit, I have not come up with any better explanation, Erickson says. And so as Peter takes us to a base of scripture, he also takes us to scripture because it becomes the place where we find our race, our people, our identity, who we are. Whoops. And then finally, a race, a base, a race, and then a place that I've already alluded to, but he is rooting us in this story, right? That the prophets prophesied this longing that they had to look into inquiring in verse 11, what person or what time, right? This, 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 as one commentator said, this untoward thing of suffering that was going to happen. They wanted to see it, but they couldn't. They, they didn't really fully understand yet what was, but they were longing for it. And then even this last line, they, the prophets have a longing that can't be fulfilled, but then even the angels have this longing. They're longing to look into the good news of the gospel and, and what has happened in Jesus, right? And here's my point. Peter is saying to his readers, you have a better place. You stand at a better vista looking at the story of scripture than they do. It is a privileged status, as one commentator put it. Because you see, you have a, your superior people of the church in Cappadocia and here in Crozet, because historically, you are superior historically to the prophets because so much more has happened and you have a clearer picture of the suffering Christ. You are superior to the angels experientially because they have no need of grace or mercy. And so we get to experience this in a way they long to look into it, but we can know it and experience it and engage with this. And so what does the fact of, of sitting here, again, here's what one, if I can find my quote, um, one commentator said, uh, here it is. Clearly, the gospel message is of great value if it is the focus of attention of the prophets of old and the angels of heaven. And yet you, Peter is saying, have received this precious message. What's my point here? When you have a privileged place, a precious message, is that to puff you up in pride? Well, I have this cool thing. Ideally not, right? Instead, it is to drop our jaw and to be like, really? Upon me, this has fallen? Upon me, I have given eyes to see the joy, the hope, the engagement, the gratitude of response, right? Is that not then what is happening in eight and nine again? 
that though we don't see him, we love him, that we engage with the Lord, that in his, what does verse 10 say? Grace. He has opened eyes that we might see from scripture this story, hear from the apostles this story. And not just go, oh, that's cool information. Fall in love with it. Be transformed by it. And so we have a privileged place. It's one practical implication here, which I, I'll just say quickly, is remember we always read the Bible backwards from our privileged place. We don't read it like a textbook where you're leading, reading this chapter, then that chapter, and that chapter. We don't read it like an ethics book where it's just morality. What do I do? You read the Bible like a math book. Because where's the answer to all the story, all the chapters before? They're in the back of the book. And that's the way you read scripture. When you come to the Old Testament or to any part of scripture, we should be asking, how is this showing me the glory of Christ? How is this showing my need for Christ? How is this showing the grace he's extending to sinners like me? There's a lot of how that works out, but it's a practical that we want to do because what's this saying? What's Peter saying? It's all about Jesus. Scripture is, and Lord willing, our life is, our heart. May he help us this week as we move forward that even all of life would be about Jesus. Let's pray. Our great Father, on your throne, victorious, risen Jesus, and Holy Spirit, who is alive and working in us, do please enliven our hearts to be convinced that we are yours and use your word to do it. Please. We ask all of this in your name and all God's people saying, Amen. 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 Let's stand and sing as we prepare for the table. We are going to pick up on our gathering song. And, uh, and the second verse of Come Thou Fount, preparing the transition here. us that he did interpose his precious blood, as you just sang. That the story of Christ's sufferings and glory led through the cross. Through his perfect life, first fulfilling the law for his people, but then also through his death and sacrifice, satisfying the sin penalty for his people, and rising to new life to offer one day a new world of resurrection life where there will be a table spread and fullness of which this is just a foretaste. If that is your faith, that Jesus has lived and died and risen for you, and you are part of his story, if you've made that faith public by joining a church and being baptized, and they preach this same message of the gospel, then this is your table. Because this isn't just our table, it's Jesus' table. But if that's not yet your faith, we're so glad that you're here. 
considering these things, I hope. But since this is a meal of faith, I want to ask you not to eat this meal if you don't believe in who Christ is. You can consider it, pray about it, think about what's been said and what this even represents. But there's no shame in not eating. We understand people at different places. But whether we're eating, whether you're not able to eat, let's remember the Christ who interposed his precious blood for us. Let's thank him. Christ, all that this represents, we cover our mouths, we drop our jaws, our our mouths are agape and saying, oh my, thank you. Thank you for this meal. Strengthen your people through it, we ask now. Amen. I remind you, the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Join me. Is the Father with us? Yes. Is Christ among us? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit here? Yes. This is our God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are his people. We are redeemed by his grace. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ, our Passover, sacrifice for us. Hallelujah. These are the gifts. All right, let's do that again with a little enthusiasm. I know, sorry, but Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Hallelujah. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Feed on Christ in your hearts. Drink, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you. Again, if you are eating, extend your empty hands, showing your need for Jesus. We'll have a packet put in them. We will then eat the entire packet together and walk through that. If you need gluten-free, please raise your hand, and um, we will get that to you. But Beth's going to play while this is distributed. until the clear layer separates and peel that back. In many ways, we hold in our hands an Ebenezer, right? Our chance to remember the stone of remembrance, to remember what Christ has done. He loves you. He has purchased you. Christian, eat rejoicing. And now peel back the foil. juice represents his blood which has washed you clean and right in God's sight. Drink with hope. Let us stand and be sent from this place with a peppy song. Worshiping our Lord.
remind you, we invite you to point to the cross with your first three responses and then point up where Christ ascended with your last response. All our problems, we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties, we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works, we send to the cross of Christ. And all our hopes, we set on the risen Christ. Stretch forth your hands. Hear the historic good news which we are in this stream, this story. I'm not going to start preaching again. Okay. Here the story. <laughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. 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 Send us out of here, Dave. As Christ burst forth from the tomb, <clears throat> made new life burst forth from us and show itself in acts of love and healing to a hurting world. Let us go forth as God's Easter people. Amen. You are dismissed. Please grab coffee, muffins, donut holes. <laughs> <laughs>